My name's Betsy and I will be your MC here in Tux today. Um, this is Ash, in case she joins at any point, you know who that is. Um, and I am joining you today from the lands of the Yagara people, um, the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking. Uh, so we're all here, we all enjoyed the keynote, we've all got our coffee. And our first speaker today is Jeff. So um, Jeff Walsh is here with us. Uh, Jeff is a system software engineer, generally found elbow deep in the crusty part of the code base that needs work. When not screaming why at commit logs, he is often seen around working with or talking about bikes. So uh, Jeff might have some time to answer questions live at the end of his talk. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, uh, please type it into the chat in Venulus there and proceed it with the word question in all caps so that our lovely chat monitors can find it. Sorry, I'm just shaking cap fur off of everything right now. That's what that is. Um, and if, if there's time at the end, I will relay those questions to Jeff and I'll answer them. All right. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Betsy. So teaching an old bovine new tricks. I got to say 2020 wasn't all that bad. We got a new release of Emacs. Um, you know, there's some history where sometimes a major release will take 10 years, but this year, not so much. Um, there was a huge jump in 27.1 for some reason. It just felt like we just took a huge leap. Um, half buzz support. So good font rendering, so which gives us ligatures, it gives us a whole heap of other stuff, color emojis, uh, native JSON support in C, so much, much quicker than the the, lib, uh, the Lisp version of it. Portable dumping, which sort of allows a bit of a speed up for, for startup and, and shutdown and stuff like that. And more importantly, tabs. Uh, this is a feature that had been asked for since the dawn of time, basically since you sort of your old Firefox four days when it introduced tabs. And it seemed like a lot of things were getting sorted. Unfortunately, Naval gazing set in. I mean, you had tabs, what else did you want? But it kind of descended into a bit of a, hey, you know, how can we make Emacs more popular? How can we how can we improve and get new users? We're lagging behind Vim. And this this is spilt over into LWN at least once, went over to Hacker News and a heap of others. And I mean, there were still remnants of this discussion going on as late as December. Truth is, this just happens every single year. This is a thing of Emacs Devil. Um, 2020 was only kind of unusual in that it was a release year. There were two of them and more people were home to uh, sitting, working from home and, and doing stuff from home to actually pile in on the discussion. So more opinions being thrown about. Some of the, some of the features were getting discussed. Um, it's, it's mostly because like actually it could take a lot of, a lot of time for it because you know, there's always this initial resistance from the old hands and I'm probably getting towards that stage now. But you know, if someone is able to, to present code in front of developers and maintainers, it's usually we'll see welcoming reviews. I mean, you can just about play this uh, bingo on these this, uh, this discussion list because every year there's we should change Emacs Lisp to JavaScript, TypeScript, TCL, whatever. We should replace the C mode with Rust or whatever other language that is supposedly safer. And we should probably go and use the CUA, the the common user access key bindings that are found in every single other editor. I mean, that has been done, but they want to do it by default now. Um, and I think that would sort of lose some of the essence. I mean, changing that Emacs Lisp with C or, or that, that Emacs Lisp to, to a JavaScript or even the C parts with the JavaScript um, basically just makes it Emacs, uh, a version of Emacs code, VS code. Um, so we're kind of then getting to a point with what is Emacs? There are some other things that we always see. There's like a, this idea of things that are very technically hard, that would involve tons of work, but would be welcomed by the list. And that is, let's make the list bit a little bit faster. Try and write less C, write more Lisp. Um, try to, like that's the key takeaway from, the, uh, from Emacs is that it is a Lisp editor. And then try and make the stuff that we already have in Lisp a bit faster, a bit more interactive, a bit more live. Secondary, we desperately needed to rewrite that next part of the GUI, like the GUI. Um, it's currently fragile. Small changes can have knock-on effects on tons of platforms. Um, and X is kind of changing underneath us as well. It's, it's a long needed thing, but it's, it's gonna be very hard. So I guess a lot of people started in that navel gazing going, well, why am I using Emacs? And in my case, 
it's just too damn late. Um, I've tried changing a couple of times. It's, it's, it's clunky now for me to change because I'm so used to it. I go and type stuff on a web browser and then I'll end up quitting it at least twice because I'm used to my workflow. I mean, it's been built up over a number of years. As I said, 10 years has been paying the bills. Um, you might say a mechanic has their toolbox and that is my toolbox for when I'm writing code. Um, it's my familiar environment. It's home for me. Any new features that look interesting that come up in you in other editors that so your sidebars, your your tab complete, like some of your completions, snippets, all that sort of stuff, if it's worthy, it gets ported really, really quickly. And I guess the main key thing is that when Emacs is paying the bills for me, it's because I'm writing C and Emacs actually treats C as C and not a poor man C as was the case many years ago. And I've kind of alluded to in the title. Why, why would you want Wayland? Uh, I know it's contentious and I've got a chance of derailing and talk really, really quickly, but it kind of works on my box and I'm happy. It, it kind of feels like it's dragging Linux desktop environments into the modern age, like compatible, like comparable to your Windows and your Macs. Um, it just feels a bit more complete. I understand it, it's a change in environment, a change in feel for a lot of people, but my needs are kind of simple and it kind of feels like Emacs was the, the, thaw, the sore thumb sticking out that wasn't Emacs, uh, that wasn't on Wayland. Um, it was that little bit clunky, running the old trick, the old joke from XKCD of MX Butterfly um, would noticeably lag. Um, it's gotten better, X Wayland has gotten a lot better, but it's still, I'd like to get to a box where I don't have to compile the X libraries if I can. All that considered, it's worth looking at what is Emacs as a thing. And there's the age old joke that we've all seen and it's posted on at least every single LWN uh, comment board and Hacker News at least three times. It just needs a great editor, right? The truth is, it's not really an editor. It's a Lisp environment that's been ported to Unix. It just happens to have an editor I like built into it. And yes, we support at least four or five different Vim bindings. Um, there's new ones out all the time because we're pretty accommodating. But the key thing is that it is Lisp and it has some flow and effects there. No Lisp is no Emacs. You know, Lisp is not about taking a problem and then trying to define it in constructs of the language. It's about building a new language around the problem itself. Um, you create things that, you create data structures, you create functions, and it's all feel, it feels like it's naturally part of the language rather than an attack on like some of the more procedural languages or class languages. Um, it creates a different expectation of development. Um, you're expected at this point to go and um, be able to bend things and, and modify things and manipulate things as required, uh, which isn't always the case and ends up creating some, um, some massive workarounds in other languages. And so, as I said, it creates this sort of this environment where, you know, we're expected to be able to modify everything. So pressing J on a keyboard literally calls a list function to insert J in the buffer on the screen. And this allows a lot of those sort of modifications as key binding changes to come into form. You know, arrow up presses previous line, all these things can be modified. So, you know, if you really needed to, if you've broken a key on your keyboard and you have waiting on an order to come through, you could probably emulate it by hitting another key. And uh, I guess a few people looking to start with Emacs go, well, what plugins do I need? What plugins should I use for, for this language or that language? How do I get this set up? And that's the thing, it's not really plugins. You're genuinely creating an extension to the Lisp environment. You're actually running, um, you're, you're running, running code that is sort of equivalent to the rest of the core. And so this kind of fits through of, you know, you've got to build your Emacs environment to get your Emacs environment. So when I talk about that sort of that config language or that extension language, if you think about, you know, your, your APIs in say, your, your eclipses and that sort of thing, there is a defined boundary. There's sort of the editor and the config. It's not the case in Emacs. So 60% is 60% of the, the 3.2 million lines of code is Lisp. So that puts it at 1.8, 1.6 million, quick math. Um, and you know, that second line of 16% is just the change log. So it maintains a text change log for every major feature that goes in. And so that's every file change. And that's, that's 20, 30, 35 years of history now. You know, the rest of it, that 15% down the bottom, that's porting to every other language that includes X toolkits, um, the old Athena X toolkit. It includes any sort of list special form, so your base core features of the language that sort of equivalent to your libc, and redisplay, which that's the fun part. 
Reader's Play code was C written by Lispers for Lispers with some compilers that predates a lot of the standards. So, I mean, I've written a lot of C code in ANSI C89, um, maybe with a couple of 99 extensions. Emacs has sort of history that dates from the earlier parts of the 80s. So C standards just weren't yet established. Um, on top of that, there's tons of macros. Just about every every call you need to make will involve writing two or three macros, or using two or three macros to abstract away 40 years of history. Um, there are tons of just small changes that are just simply there to actually overcome a bug or an incompatibility on one particular platform. And so tracing execution of redisplay is notoriously difficult. It's one of the most difficult parts of, of the code base. Um, you know, originally it was written to minimize lag on networks in MIT from, you know, the early 80s before Ethernet started becoming usable. And to this day, it still has some of that code. So the next section, I'm basically just pilfering everything from, from Daniel here. And he, I would recommend going and checking out Buttery Smooth Emacs. It's, it is a, a Facebook page he's written up, but it, it goes through far more detail and far more interesting points. But the key thing is uh, the next bit's gonna be a bit crazy. So Emacs was never really a graphical user interface. It was always written as a terminal thing. And there was this X project going on in another part of MIT in the early days. And so I could say that Emacs was an early adopter of X, but I really mean X was kind of ported to Emacs. Um, it wants to own every part of its loop. So it has its own event loop to be able to redisplay. If the redisplay system gets asked to go and draw on the screen by X, which is an expose call, and redisplay is not finished, Emacs will tell it to bugger off. Here's a gray rectangle. I'll fill it in when I'm damn good ready. To this day, Emacs wants to be the master of its own domain. Like the modern Xcode still has little features about or every little detail that's in there, um, tries to track everything. And part of that redisplay interact where it just draws that gray rectangle, um, creates this flickery mess that sort of got solved about five, 10 years ago in well, at least five, 10 years ago on every other major toolkit. At some point, we decided to port it to GTK in, in hopes of improving things. Um, the truth is we didn't really port to GTK. We basically just took X and just said, yeah, near enough. So effectively, we create a GTK window and then we shove X calls in, in, inside that window. And then any event that comes in is an X event that gets forwarded off to the Lisp engine. And, you know, near enough. We basically typecast away any, any GCC, GCC warnings, and then just call it and effectively ignore all of GTK. At some point, GTK3 was released and we thought probably should port to that. Just if def it out. Still using the same calls, still using the same backends, still ignoring GTK. And I mean, I know GTK3 had some more major inputs, uh, more major changes over time, but realistically, that's all Emacs has done. A couple of things to change names and that's it. At some point, someone wanted to print from Emacs because printers were a bit more commonplace in households. And so they wrote a Cairo backend. Um, if anyone's used the Mac, yeah, Matsumoto Emacs Mac port um, with buttery smooth like, scrolling, all that sort of stuff. So he actually did all the work for Cairo um, back in 2008. And it was periodically maintained by other, other people. Um, and it was kept alive for a number of years. At some point, another, another person came out and decided, well, GDK supports Wayland, and we've got Cairo, sort of. Cairo is used for Wayland, could we not just use Emacs on Wayland? Not quite, because it needs a bit more setup, but eventually someone did come out and show, hey, I'm using these, this Cairo patch shirt, I've set up the back end, um, I've got a rudimentary version of Emacs on Wayland. But it was just for a learning exercise to, uh, to sort of understand how Redisplay worked, and. It was kind of short-lived. Um, this is back in 2014. Um, the code just marched on. Eventually in 2015, as a result of that, that sort of proof of concept that Cairo could be used as a display, redisplay engine, the, tool, the patch kit was, uh, the patch was merged in 2015, February 2015. Um, this was only removed from, exper like, from experimental status for 27.1 uh, back in 2019 and in 28.1, it'll eventually become stable. Um, so from 2008 to 2020, 12 years, um, to get a major feature of that. So this is where 
LCA, uh, so this is where Emacs sort of came to it at LCA 2019. I tried picking up that 2014 Cairo, uh, Cairo Emacs port. Um, it had just, it just deteriorated too much. Too, too many things had changed, too many names had changed. Files had just disappeared. There was no equivalence anymore. So um, it's still quite, kind of wasn't ready to go. Um, and I, I guess the other thing to look at is that, you know, that X terminal code, trying to even just pull stuff out of that, that's at 20,000 lines. Um, it's, it's huge. Sometimes soon after LCO, so this was about April, about two months later, um, one of the previous Emacs maintainers had pointed out in a long discussion about how we can move Cairo to use ligatures and, um, and emojis and all those sort of great features that most modern editors are now adopting. Um, said, hey, there's this GTK3, pure GTK3 port, maybe, maybe it'll work. Let's, let's see what happens. Does anyone know about it? And the key point of the, the GTK port was that we could migrate all of the X focus code across the GTK equivalents. We could cut out what doesn't make sense. We could leverage that Cairo port that was now quickly becoming less experimental. And then any of the drawing changes, any of the major maintenance burden would stay upstream, even as we maintain as a port set. And ideally we'll try and cheat, G, treat GTK as GTK and not just bastardize it with X. So first off, create a new terminal option. Add, like set up the initialize, register all these list functions, and we try and if def and type pun out common code. So there are cases in the GTK common code that sort of go, oh, we're expecting an X display and we're gonna go, well, no, it's a GDK display and we can figure out what the differences are later. Um, a bit of a bit of a tour through some of the files. So the the GDK term um, header and, and, and source file effectively are the core, to, core toolkit code. They basically are the layer across the GTK. Um, it handles getting the, like the initialization code. It gets a window up on the screen. Um, it actually handles GTK events for a change um, and then dispatches them as required and helps without the, the abstraction macros. This is common across all of the terminal headers um, and then keeps a massive state structure, um, which again is common across all versions of Emacs. PGK uh, functions uh, and also the win. So this is your, your, bri um, your bridge across to the Lisp. Um, defines everything. It handles interactions. So basically, this is full of macros. Um, there's a lot of Lisp looking headers for function. It declares a C function to, be, to call. It defines a Lisp function to call and interacts and it just collects it all up the bottom somewhere. And I guess this is, this is the key point. This is Emacs widget. Um, the, the illustrious history of an Emacs editor is now kind of compressed down to a small widget. Um, effectively could be used in any GTK3 program. Um, mostly it's used as an endpoint for events. So events will be fired at a particular widget in GTK3. And so this is our way to pull them out and act on them. Um, and it allows us to actually contain other GTK widgets. So a couple of surprising things is that porting across some of the scroll bars or even the, uh, the, uh, web GTK, like the WebKit uh, GTK func uh, widget just sort of got absorbed into the, the, uh, the fixed widget and it seemed to work. GTK util is where all the draw most of the drawing happens. Um, it is shared across pure and, and impure GTK Emacs. So that's, it's kind of useful because then that, that's the key part that um, we are able to just pilfer and, and steal and use um, without too much trouble. Um, it handles a lot of the scroll bars, it handles a lot of the, like the GTK specific stuff. So, hey, I want, I want menu bars in my window, I want this toolbar, I want the widget, and I want all this other stuff included. And that's all handled in this file. And we've got a couple other things. So this is basically just handling rectangles. Um, probably the smallest file and all that. Um, effectively, there's a couple of little things in there, just the fake values that are expected by part, core parts of Emacs. Um, it wants to be able to set gravity on, on windows where it appears on the screen, top right, top left, center, anything like that. Um, we've kind of just got to fill in the blanks and make it work and adapt them to the, the GTK expected values, but without sort of, by basically by adapting the names. And, and then there's a couple other smaller files. So um, 
GDK input management uh, method. So like any effectively key key developer on this was uh, was Japanese. So getting um, Japanese characters on screen was very very important um, to fit in with the rest of the workflow. So we start to behave a bit more like a GDK app rather than just an app that does what it wants when it wants. Um, PG, uh, the GDK select um, that's the drag and drop. So in previous iterations, select would be used for hooking into a, uh, a call, a, a system call, or a, um, an event interrupt um, to actually redisplay like what text needs to be on the screen. So um, that's, that's kind of why I've, I've pulled that one out a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, menus for menu bars because, again, it, it's separate. We're not just sort of drawing this manually with X widgets. So a few core challenges on Emacs. It's, it's huge. Um, there's sort of competing priorities here. X Emacs wants to know everything. It had to know everything back in the day. It predates basically all your major toolkits. Um, it's had to carry its own toolkit along just to, to avoid a few bugs. It, it sort of, as I said, it, it's 20,000 lines of code with tons of if death with, with you know, just parse and, and, and treat like uh, all versions, all sort of uh, like if defs, uh, if else this, whatever. There's so many branches in there. It's just very, very hard to work with. GDK and, and more specifically GDK, um, try to extract that. They just want you to be able to go, I want a widget, put it on a screen, put what you want in there, off we go. I'll handle the events or just pass them through to where you need to go and I'll translate them and filter them as we need to and make them a bit more specific. Um, it's the, the, the X code has evolved over time to a point where there's little little inserts here and there. Some of those if defs that were just a simple, hey, if we're running on GTK, call this one function. And if we're running on our own Athena widget, um, here's a small line of code that we need to do. Some of those have grown out to be well over a thousand lines each. So even just copy and pasting and pulling those out just don't necessarily make sense anymore. Um, you know, a lot of the old sort of, we're going to reset this here, like have a quick comment of like, oh, bug X, whatever. Uh, let's, we've got to reset the screen because it causes an issue on someone's box. Just don't seem to make sense anymore. Or just have had context lost over time. Um, and so trying to follow why a change was made and if we need to keep it anymore because potentially um, compatibility has got better over time. Um, it's just very hard to follow. Um, and then it, it, the big thing is you're going to try and filter out what fixes, what's important and what, you know, um, and keep sort of the intentional code that's meant to be there, the core bits that need to run. So I think I've alluded to this a little bit. GTK events are not X events. X, Emacs expects raw X events to the point where it just goes, oh yeah, typecast is to an Emacs structure that's internal. And this has been adapted on the Mac port, it has been adapted on the, the Windows port, and it mostly, mostly works. Um, but then we get to a point where parts of GTK need the raw event that it was given to operate on quickly so it can filter out more information than what it's going to provide in an interface. And Emacs doesn't like that. It wants everything to go through the Lisp layer. It wants you to be able to take that event, hook in on it at the Lisp layer, and act on that event yourself. Maybe you don't want that going through to the rest of the terminal. Maybe you want to do something else with it. Maybe you want to say, okay, cool, when we resize the window, I want it to flash bright purple. It's something that you know you could do in Lisp, and we're kind of, kind of getting to a point where it, it may not be something we can support anymore. Um, generally, to keep both sides happy, we've just lied. Um, or you know, we've picked up a couple of deprecated sort of functions that we'll eventually have to work around. But lying to keep both sides happy has just been the easier way of proceeding at the moment. In a GTK only world, um, there's still a few discrepancies. So X versus Wayland. Uh, one of the key features of Wayland is that windows are independent. They can't see anything around it. They don't know the rest of the context. Um, and the coordinates start from zero. X supports global coordinates. Uh, so that causes a few issues where uh, if we're trying to calculate, hey, I want to put this pop-up on the screen, which is a feature added in, in 26. Um, in X, it needs to calculate, in original X, it needs to calculate, okay, Emacs is in this location on the screen, the corner of the window is here, and then we can offset down to this point. In PG, uh, pure GTK, we sort of go, okay, where's the corner of the window? We need to offset this far inside the window. And we get different values. On Wayland, 
that'll take from the top corner of the um, of the drawn window, and then on X it'll take the entire decorated window. And so swapping between the two, we get a variation where X will be off by 25 pixels, and then Wayland will be sitting lower. And then at some point window sizes will change and it'll expect things to be a bit different and so your pop-ups end up just bouncing all over the place and this ended up being about three weeks of my life at one point just any spare minute i had of code was just trying to figure out how to how to actually um get that position calculation right eventually we just lied to emacs again and just said this is a window but realistically it's just a widget so the widget stays within its bounds it stays on the emacs window it's relevant to the parent window um, the top corner of the drawn text er editor area and it stays still it doesn't move it doesn't bounce around it's the right size it's the right position on all platforms now so that's finally been solved and then integration i mean we already talked about x being huge on its own this change set was equally big um the original commits to hey i want to start a uh, pure gtk3 port was late 2017 early 2018 i think i jumped on about a year later in 2019 um and then eventually i decided to thought we should probably rebase clean up fix up the commit formats to meet expected um expected norms of the emacs repository and that took a number of passes uh, a lot of git rebase history a lot of manipulation um that was another month uh so in the end i got well over 300 commits down to about 100 ended up being about 58 uh, 58 changed files in total so a lot of the other lot of the other uh, files were like okay we've got a fourth option now of a, of a graphical terminal it's not just x macOS, win32 and now we've got pgdk a couple of things we got to call extra symbols or a couple of extra things like that but yeah there was what sixteen thousand lines changed and um yeah quite quite a huge quite a huge effort um so it doesn't just work um yes uh it's been developed on two different platforms so i've generally favored using fedora at home just because i, I can't be asked setting up stuff anymore um yuki harani who i worked with he was on, on wl roots he's been using uh wayfire which is a comp version of, of on wayland now um i've played around with it on freebsd on wayland um seems to work it's been my daily driver for close to 12 months. Um, there's been a couple of little annoyances. Most of them have now been fixed. Um, so like in general, I just, I don't notice much of a difference um, if I'm jumping between the two, but I do tend to prefer the, the Wayland version. Just again, it's a little bit smoother. It's a little bit, little bit clearer. Um, it should also work on X version. And that's where some of the bugs have come from because we've generally built, tested and run on Wayland only systems and people have gone, oh, I wanna run this on an X system now. Um, I wanted to test it on Dragonfly BSD just as kind of wanting to play with it at the moment. And for those who have known me for a number of years, I've really wanted to test it on uh, Open Indiana, uh, the Open Solaris successor, but I just, I just ran out of time. Um, again, there's no reason why this shouldn't work. Um, having a thoroughly modern Emacs on, on a thoroughly old school uh, Unix could be quite interesting. Um, and I guess at this point now, we're expecting to be almost bug compatible with X Emacs, apart from a couple of things. Um, there have been a few things where I think we're rendering fonts slightly differently, which is kind of interesting because we should be identical. We're using the exact same font code, just in two different contexts. Um, I have not verified this and I haven't actually measured it, but a few people have claimed that it seems to render faster, it seems to scroll faster. But on the consequence, we do use a little bit more RAM compared to a base Emacs install. Um, this might be tied to the fact that we're now including all of GTK. There are some things I'm just not going to support. Um, this sort of level, I, I had to pull in you know, an XKCD, but this is just going to be something I'm just not going to be able to fix. Um, there are no X, X settings on Wayland. So we've, we've jumped across to using G settings instead. We've got a schema. Uh, it's in the repo. You can have a look. So some things you can modify from a dot file outside of that. And the other major point is going to be that 
Wayland doesn't support global uh, positioning. It leaves positioning of windows up to the display manager that it's used, the compositor. So you can't just go, every time I start Emacs, I want it to be in the bottom right-hand corner. I, it's just something we can't do. GDK doesn't provide it. Um, it's just not gonna happen, unfortunately. Um, there are a few other little bits. Some of it just doesn't make sense. Um, the way we used to hook into X to get events, um, again, there's, there were a few list functions around that. I'm just not gonna support it. There's just no point. Where does GDK Emacs go next? We try and march on to master. Uh, well, I think it got renamed to main in the last couple of weeks, actually. So if that's um, if you're looking for it, that it might have changed. Um, we're currently a feature brand. So if you look for feature slash PGDK, we're on Savannah, the GNU Savannah. Um, so we've sort of been nominally accepted by upstream. There's a little bit more to go. There's a lot more testing that needs to happen. It needs to be verified in a lot more boxes. Um, if someone is better at GTK than I am, and maybe even Yuki, I can't really talk for him, um, definitely gonna be appreciated. I, it's probably the first time I've actually worked with GTK in my life, and it was, there are a few times where the docker just didn't necessarily sit well. Um, it didn't seem to make sense, or it didn't actually do what it said, and it may have been, may have been a fact that in GTK 3, it was designed for X initially, and so this is supported on X, but it just doesn't make sense anywhere else. I mean, we could look at GDK4 as a next option. Again, that's sort of a massive reset. It's a bigger change from two to three. Um, it was finally released in December. I had actually played with porting it further. So instead of being two options, instead of having two options for a, a GDK3 uh, display renderer, we could potentially just jump over and just go from GDK4, we're not gonna support X anymore, explicitly support X. We're just gonna jump straight to four and it'll be all in four. Um, the more I look at it, like, I mean, when I was playing with it, a lot of stuff wasn't settled. Drag and drop was not even written just yet. It was still being reviewed. Um, and it, it could create a lot, like, it could create a bit more drama. There's a lot more changes there uh, from three to four that would actually, um, it would actually make it a lot harder. So some of the changes there is about splitting up the drawing into smaller sections. And I, I just don't think it would make sense for, for Emacs because, it wants to render the whole screen at once. We could potentially start splitting out based on um, each buffer, each window. Um, but that, again, may not make sense. Uh, I know someone has played with it. He seems to claim that he has got pure GDK support on two, three, and four. Um, I've had a look at it. Some of the code probably won't make it upstream, but it, if you, it seems to have some good luck with it. So, I mean, sounds good. I know there's a trend recently to port, there's been a few terminals with uh, OpenGL, Vulk, and DirectX stuff, I guess, uh, in um, for the text rendering. And one thing to note is that Cairo took 12 years to get upstream. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to like Emacs version 37 or something when it might come out. Um, rendering, text rendering on a GPU involves a lot more work. It involves a considerable amount more um, prep for each glyph. Um, we could just sort of take a known size and just bladder it onto the screen, but everything we do at the moment is in SVG, so we can resize it quickly and easily, and it allows us to have varied size, um, variable sized um, and very proportion fonts on the screen. It, it may not buy as much yet. I know there's some work on like in half bars and a few others to actually improve rendering to a, a, an OpenGL or Vulkan context. Um, I'd be for it, but I just, I don't have that background. But I guess, what about the wider Emacs? What's next for that? Um, genuinely, I, I don't see Emacs breaking away from its like its potentially ugly view, its ugly looks. Um, the key bindings are gonna stay. There's too many old hands, and I'm unfortunately now one of them, that are just too used to those key bindings that they won't change. And the unfortunate thing is that on Emacs level, it, you, as soon as you nominate something that would be a, a major change and like, hey, why don't we change this by default? Um, old hands could add in this one line of code to turn it back off. Out come all these people who you've never seen in your life just go, oh, no, nah, this would be a disaster. We're not doing it. Um, look, it, I, I wouldn't be opposed to changing to the other key bindings by default if I can go back to them quickly and easily. But there's been a strong adherence to let's not upset our old users. That's our core base. Um, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to stay like that for a while. And as far as the ugliness, like GDK is not going to fix that. It's still a white sort of white on gray sort of appearance at the moment. I mean, you can make it look better, but it's, it's a customization thing. We're providing the environment more so than actually providing a complete editor. 
And I don't think Lisp is going to be replaced. I mean, there was talk of replacing it with another Lisp, um, and then we end up in a massive sort of, if you thought the how do we make Emacs more popular ones are a, a sort of a big bike shetty type discussion, try reading one of these. Uh, half the camp wants Scheme, half the camp wants uh, Common Lisp because both are supported, one's faster, one's this. Um, and then you get the others going, but what about supporting Emacs Lisp in Scheme or in this one? And then it just, it goes on for months and months and months. I, I still don't think that'll happen. I think Emacs Lisp has too many core things that are built into it now to rent, to modify text, to modify whole buffers at a, as a, at a time. I, I can't see it changing. But I think an interesting point that's been made in the last couple of, thing, a couple of years is that we're moving towards libraries rather than do it yourself or not invented here, I guess. There's this move to Cario and half bars and, and now that to the JSON library. I can see that trend continuing. I can see us pushing more stuff back out. So just by moving stuff across to half bars, we got ligatures for free. We got, uh, we got smileys and stuff like that in, included for free. And there's a few other libraries. There's always been this hesitation just because uh, what if that, that library is not supported on this old, on old Unix system that everyone used to use? And we've kindly gotten to a point that in the last couple of years, we've just got to start dropping them. No one uses Erics anymore. SGI hasn't supported Erics for close to 10, 15 years now. And it's the same with some of the other ones. We might just have to go, if we can't comport, if we can't port that library to the new system, maybe we've just got to drop it. And there's still going to be a perfectly functioning Emacs from a number of years ago that is still going to work. Again, I'm not a maintainer. It's not my choice. But for you know the people making a decision are kind of a bit more receptive to that as an option. I mean, there are still a couple of things that we aren't going to do. We're going to keep in-house. Like the, the font rendering isn't handled by the Pango library like half of GDK. And I mean, it would make things a lot quicker, a lot smoother. But internally, there's still a few rough edges with the Pango library. Um, it doesn't handle bi-directional support quite as well as Emacs does. Um, I know the, the bi-directional project for Emacs took five or 10 years, and it was written well before Pango was sort of getting to be a usable state. So I think... There's still going to be a couple of things we're going to keep internal, but the, the push to go to new stuff is, is sort of is good. And it'd be it would be a miss for me not to mention this. Native compilation has sort of had a huge ripple effect throughout the community. Um, I'd say more than pure GDK, but I just I don't have the headspace to even help out on that. So Andrea Corello asked in late 2009, "Hey, would anyone be receptive to using libgcc JIT?" as a back-end compiler for Emacs. And everyone's like, yeah, sounds great. Didn't expect it to actually deliver. Um, a month later, he had a working prototype. And he was like, yeah, it's kind of rough. Crashes all the time. But, you know, it compiles, it loads, it does a few things and then dies. The stabilization since then has been incredible. Um, again, this has now become part of my daily driver. Um, I sort of run a merged branch between PGDK and, and the native compilation branch. And I, I guess the big thing there is it supports all the platforms that we expect it to and it meets the political requirements of GNU. Like, we're not relying on libraries. There's always this talk of like, oh, could we use LLVM? But it's outside the GNU project. I mean, yes, it's a BSD-ish license, but it's still not going to fit the same goals. And this is a political, a political project. We've sort of got to go with it. And I think it does provide a few things that it gets that back to that point of, it's going to allow us to write more Lisp in Lisp, uh, more Emacs in Lisp. Um, we're going to migrate code back to list. I'm seeing it a little bit now. Um, again, huge, huge mailing list warning. But it's going to allow, I think, even more customization. Um, I think the distributions that we're starting to see, Doom Emacs, Space Max, uh, Prelude, all these sort of things, might take on a larger role. We might see these dis distributions become, I guess, your VS Code to your Atom. Your, like, they're going to become a more complete offering instead. But it kind of doesn't matter anyway because everything's going on. This, this presentation's in a web browser. Um, no one's really using a computer anymore. Everyone's on phones and tablets and stuff. So I guess the Emacs is just going to go down in an ancient era of computing that kind of doesn't make sense anymore. So should we be thinking about another port? Should that rewrite of C just be JavaScript? Maybe then an extension library could just be JavaScript. I'm not so sure. Because we could just run Emacs in a browser anyway, and we're finally taking advantage of using libraries that we've already pulled out. This is Emacs running on GTK Broadway in my browser. 
it, it's not going to show now, but there we go. We're just in, just in Google there. So we can now do it. We could run this up in a, uh, an AWS drop or AWS cloud or droplet, whatever, it doesn't matter. And then just access it in our files that way. With that, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people. Yuki Hirano, who's been the main developer, he wrote most of those 16,000 lines of code, um, possibly, possibly much, much more. Um, I think I squashed a lot of the rewrites, so some of it was missing. Buttery Smooth Emacs, if you want to get a, a hilarious take on the state of redisplay in 2016, when he tried to port double buffering to it. Um, again, something that was always there. If you want to look at some of the other features in, in uh, Emacs 27.1, check out Mastering Emacs. And of course, I want to say thank the developers, the maintainers, and the rest of the Emacs community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. That was a super interesting talk. I checked, I know you couldn't see, but I checked in on the chat a couple times and the audience was pretty enthusiastic there. So <laughs> thank, thank you. you very much. Um, if you have any questions, we have four minutes, so please type them into the chat and prefix by question in all caps, um, and we can see if we can fit some in. Um, I have a bit of a question prepared in advance that um, <laughs> to fill in some time. Um, so, Jeff, I think you said back at the beginning that, like, I. Uh, You've been using Emacs a long time, so it's kind of just part of your tooling and your system, and it's just how you work, right? Yep. What would you say to somebody who learned to code using like IDEs and has always coded in IDEs, but is interested in the idea of switching to something a bit more simpler um, and yep. is intrigued by Emacs, but intimidated by the lengthy history and age of yep. Emacs. What would you say to them? Jump on one of the, the pre-built toolkits. Tool There's no shame in using them. Um, again, I've, I've pilfered code out of a lot of that stuff. Um, so I've, I've, I've got some stuff out of Doom Emacs that just makes sense for my, for my, inter, um, for my startup. So I would probably recommend Doom Emacs Especially if you, I mean, for most people who come from Vim key bindings, it has them by default, but it should be easy enough to, to swap that out back to um, back to like either more common sort of Windows sort of key bindings or back to the uh, the um, the original Emacs ones. Or just, I mean, I, I, my repo is up there depending on what you need. As I said, it's very tailored to C and a couple other things. But generally, trying to engage on even Reddit and the Emacs subreddit has a lot of features. Um, the history probably shouldn't matter as much as it does. It only really matters when you come to actually modifying the code base. Um, it's always, I think a lot of people go, use Vim because it's always there. Use Vim because that's what you're told to use in uni. I tried, hated it. I can't get used to the modal settings. I'm, again, it's too late for me. Um, I think I failed uh, that many Red Hat courses because I expected to use Vim. <laughs> but I just, I'm so used to it now. Um, it does take a long time. I can't I remember thinking in like back in 10, 15 years ago, it was like, how am I going to get used to this? Like there's, there's guys who've just done it for 10 years and they're so used to it. And eventually it just happens. Um, if you do want to have a look at it, if you want to read a book to sort of get used to some of the thought behind it, Mastering Emacs is actually like, it's a website, but also there's a book available, an ebook available on there. And every time I, I've reread it twice and I've picked up new things each time, um, it sort of goes into the, the theory of why the key, bind, key bindings are in such a way they are. Great. Thank you. Um, and we've also got a question from the audience. Uh, the question is, if we want to try out the Wayland version, what do we do? Okay, so there are a couple... If you're using Arch Linux, it's already in there because it's Arch. There are Fedora repos. There are a number of repos that will have a PGDK Emacs. So if you search in some of your like um, user uploaded ones, they should be there. If you want to build it locally, um, it's a Git checkout. Go to savannah.org, I think it is, or just search for GNU Savannah. And then on the Emacs part, it'd be one of the feature branches. Um, there's also an Emacs mirror on GitHub if you prefer. So you can check out Emacs mirror um, slash Emacs and it'll be one of the feature branches. 
My version of PGDK on my current Emacs branch is out of date because that was what was submitted about two, three months ago. Um, so it has been sitting there idle because I've just jumped onto the mainline branch. Um, but that would be my recommendation. So I know there was, I think it was someone in Brisbane who did the Fedora one. Um, and he's got a, he's got PGDK Emacs somewhere in, in copper. Um, yeah, so there, there are some ports around. Check If you don't want to build first, check your, your user uploaded repos first. Okay, thank you, Jeff. We are out of time. Um, if anybody has any further questions that for Jeff, there are there is a channel in Venulus if you might have to go to the Browse All Channels if you haven't opened it before on the left-hand side for um, Tux Theater post-talk Q&A. Um, and if you give Jeff a minute to get himself back into Venulus, he might be able to join you there. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>